Hey, welcome back. In this video, we're going to start discussing Ramsey numbers. This is also going to give us another chance to use the probabilistic method. Given two graphs, G and H, we'll define R of GH, the Ramsey number of G and H, to be the least integer n with the following property. For any red-blue coloring of the edges of the complete graph k sub n, there is a copy of g with all of the edges red in that copy, or a copy of h with all of the edges blue in that copy. When we see this definition for the first time, it's not necessarily clear that R of GH will even have a finite value um, for all graphs G and H. For example, when G and H are complete graphs, it's not clear from the definition that R of GH should even have a finite value. And we're gonna need to prove that in the video. And we will prove that by showing a general upper bound on R of complete graphs, G and H. In order to show that bound, we're gonna use a shorthand notation. We'll let R of S comma T equal R of K sub S comma K sub T. And we're gonna see how to prove a general upper bound on R of S comma T for any S and T greater than or equal to one. And since we'll have an upper bound, a finite upper bound on R of S T, then clearly that implies that R of S T is finite for all S and T. So we're gonna prove that. And R of S comma T, again, by the bullet right here, R of S comma T, is equal to R of K sub S comma K sub T. So if we know that R of S comma T is finite for all S and T, we also know that R of K sub S comma K sub T is finite for all S and T, S and T greater than or equal to one. And we can note that the complete graph whose order is the same as G. We can write that as I wrote it here in this last bullet that complete graph must contain G. Similarly, the complete graph whose order is the same as H, the one I wrote right here, I'm circling it, that one must contain H. So if we have a red copy of the complete graph whose order is the same as G, then we must have a red copy of G. And when I say red copy, I mean a copy all of whose edges are red. Similarly, if we have a blue copy of the complete graph whose order is the same as H, then we must have a blue copy of H, where again, when I say blue copy, I mean a copy all of whose edges are blue. In addition to the upper bound, we're also going to prove a lower bound in the diagonal case, the diagonal case being when S equals T. So we'll prove a lower bound on R of S comma S. And this is gonna be where we use probabilistic methods. In particular, we'll use the union bound. And when we combine our upper and lower bounds, we'll see that if we take the S root of R of S comma S, it's in the interval square root of two comma four. So it's somewhere in that interval. We're also going to look at some open problems. One of them is related to that interval that I mentioned in the last bullet. And we'll see some interesting applications. So let's start with the upper bound. In order to prove the upper bound, we're going to have this inequality, which is going to function as an inductive step. We want to prove in this inequality that the Ramsey number R of S comma T is at most the sum 
of the Ramsey numbers r of s comma t minus one and r of s minus one comma t. We want to prove this for all s and t greater than or equal to two. So we will define n and n equals the sum of the, Ram of the Ramsey numbers r of s comma t minus one and r of s minus one comma t. In other words, it's the right side of the inequality that we're trying to prove. That's our n. Suppose that we color each of the edges of k sub n either red or blue. And we want to show that we have a copy of k sub s, all of whose edges are red, or we have a copy of k sub t, all of, which is, all of whose edges are blue. So that will be what we try to prove with this assumption. We'll take an arbitrary vertex in this complete graph of order n. We'll call the vertex b. Since it's a complete graph of order n, that means that all of the vertices in the graph have n minus one neighbors. In particular, b has n minus one neighbors. So since n equals r of s comma t minus one plus r of s minus one comma t, we can conclude that at least r of s minus one t edges containing v must be red, or at least r of s comma t minus one edges containing v must be blue. If this was not true, so at least here means greater than or equal to in both these cases. If not, then the number of edges containing V would be less than or equal to R of S minus one T minus one plus R of S comma T minus one minus one, and that equals n minus two. And that's a problem because we know that v has n minus one neighbors. So we know there's n minus one edges containing v. So that's why we can conclude this fact that I just said in the bullet, that at least r of s minus one comma t of those edges must be red or at least r of s comma t minus one of those edges must be blue. So now that we looked at that in a little more detail, I'm going to clear that so that we can see the next few bullets. So I claim that this gives us a red copy of k sub s in our graph k sub n, or a blue copy of k sub t in our graph k sub n. Let's see why that's true. So let's look at the information that we have in the previous bullet. By the previous bullet, V has two possibilities. At least R of S minus one comma T of the edges containing V must be red, or at least R of S comma T minus one of the edges containing V must be blue. So let's draw a V right here. And let's consider the possibilities. So case one, case two. So case one, a bunch of these edges from B are all red edges. Just put an R on all of them. Case two, we have a lot of edges from B, which are blue. And let's specify what we mean by a lot. So the number of the edges right here is greater than or equal to R of S minus one comma T. And the number of these edges here is greater than or equal to R of S comma T minus one. Now we can look at the vertices that these edges are attached to on the other side, the other side from B. We can look at the number of these vertices. The number of these vertices, it's the same as the numbers of these edges. It's at least 
r of s minus one comma t over here on the left and the number of vertices over here on the right that is true is at least r of s comma t minus one. That tells us that among the vertices over here on the left, since there's at least r of s minus one comma t of them, we have a red k sub s minus one or a blue k sub t on the vertices that I have circled right here. Similarly, over here, since I have r of s comma t minus one vertices, and I'll, I'll circle them like I did over on the left, we can conclude that I have a red k sub s or a blue k sub t minus one on these vertices. And let me put that arrow over to them. Now recall, what we're trying to get here for r of s comma t, we want a red k sub s or a blue k sub t. So we need that for each of these two cases, case one and case two. So if case one, if we have the blue k sub t right here, then it's good, that would be great. If, if that happens, we're done with case one. If we have the red k sub s minus one, this one's more interesting because we don't have our k sub s yet. We have a k sub s minus one. The good thing is all of these edges from B were red. So we can take that k sub s minus one and combine it with V and that would give us a red KS if, if we have the red K sub S minus one. So case one, we do get a red KS or a blue KT. Similarly, in case two, if we have the red K sub S, then we're done. So that's the easy part. And the other part is not too hard. If we have the blue k sub t minus one, we want the k sub t, we have the k sub t minus one, but all the edges from b were blue, so we can take the k sub t minus one, we can add v to it, and that gives us a blue k sub t. So in case two, we also get a red k sub s or a blue k sub t. So we just saw why that bullet is true. So I'm going to clear this explanation so that we can see the last few bullets. And the last bullet gives us the upper bound we were looking for. So we just showed that in our graph k sub n, we can find a red copy of k sub s or a blue copy of k sub t regardless of how we color the edges, red or blue. So that immediately gives us the upper bound that R of S comma T is less than or equal to R of S comma T minus one plus R of S minus one comma T. In other words, we're saying here that if N equals r of s comma t minus one plus r of s minus one comma t as we defined it right here then any red blue coloring of k sub n contains a red ks or a blue kt. And by the definition of the Ramsey number, r of s comma t, that tells us that r of s comma t, which is the minimum value of n, such that any red blue coloring of k sub n contains a red k sub s or a blue k sub t, that minimum value must be less than or equal to this value r of s comma t minus one plus r of s minus one comma t. So 
we really do have the upper bound. And I have a problem for you to think about. And this upper bound will be, or well, it could be crucial for how you prove it. And the problem is to prove that R of S comma T is less than or equal to S plus T minus two, choose S minus one. And prove this for all S comma T greater than or equal to one. So note that up here, this inductive step we proved for S comma T greater than or equal to two. And this result down here is for all S comma T greater than or equal to one. One other thing I'll mention here, in the diagonal case, when S and T are equal, we get R of S comma S is less than or equal to 2S minus two, choose S minus one. And we know that that's less than or equal to two to the two S minus two. Since the sum of the binomial coefficients of two S minus two choose K for K equals zero to two S minus two, that gives us two to the two S minus two. So it's actually a strict inequality. And we can also write that as four to the S minus one. So we have an upper bound on R of S comma S. And when we raise it to the S power, one over S power, we can say that that is less than four. So now we're going to move on to the lower bound. And for the lower bound, we're also gonna prove an exponential lower bound where the base of the exponent is greater than one. Otherwise, it wouldn't be interesting. And what we're gonna show in order to get the lower bound is this result. We will prove that if n choose s times two to the one minus s choose two is less than one. So you can see from that, it looks like something that might involve the union bound. Given that assumption, I claim that the Ramsey number R of S comma S must be greater than N. So we'll try to use the union bound to prove that. And in order to prove this, what we have to show is that there exists a red blue coloring of the edges of K sub N which contains no red K sub S and no blue K sub S. In order to find that coloring, that's how we're gonna use the probabilistic method. We're gonna perform an experiment. Our experiment, we will color the edges of K sub N uniformly at random. And we're coloring the edges red or blue. So each color has probability equal to one half. Now we can consider any subset of S vertices of this graph K sub N. So the total number of subsets of S vertices of K sub N, that's gonna be N choose S. And given one of these subsets, let's call it T, we'll define an event, A sub T right here. And A sub T will be the event that the copy of the complete graph of order S on the vertices of T. So the vertices of T being these S vertices. Since they're S vertices, they give us a copy of K sub S. And that copy of K sub S for the event A sub T to be true must have all red edges or all blue edges. So A sub T is just the event that when we look at the induced subgraph of K sub T, of K sub N on the vertices of T, that induced subgraph must have all edges of the same color. And I claim that the probability of A sub T is equal to two to the one minus S choose two. Let's look a little bit more why that's true. So probability of 
a sub t, this is the probability that the subgraph of k sub n induced subgraph on the vertices of t has all edges the same color. So the copy of k of sub s on t is all same color. We can write that as the sum of two probabilities. The probability that the copy of k sub s on t has all red edges plus the probability that the copy of k sub s on t has all blue edges. And we can calculate each of these probabilities. They'll be, they'll be the same. So the probability that the copy of k sub s on the vertices of t has all of its edges red, that probability is just going to be the probability that each edge is red and multiplied together for, or for all of the edges in the copy of k sub s. So k sub s, it has s total vertices. That means that the number of edges must be s choose two. So s vertices gives us s choose two edges. And we colored these edges uniformly at random and independently. So the probability that they'll all be red is just going to be one half to the number of edges. One half the number of edges just being one half to the s choose two. And we get the same thing for the other probability. The probability that they're all blue is also one half to the s choose two. So that's why we got two divided by two to the s choose two. And we can write that as two to the one minus s choose two. So I will, I will clear that so we can see the next few bullets. So as I mentioned, the total number of subsets of s vertices in our graph k sub n is n choose s. So we can use the union bound here to look at the probability of the union of the a sub t's over all such subsets t. So the probability of the union of the a sub t's is less than or equal to the sum of the probabilities of the a sub t's. And each probability of a sub t is equal to 2 to the 1 minus s choose 2. The total number of subsets t is n choose s. So the sum of these probabilities is just equal to n choose s times 2 to the 1 minus s choose 2. And we can see that this must be less than 1 by our assumption up here. So that's what we're trying to prove is that that assumption gives us the Ramsey number of s comma s greater than n. And we're almost there. So we saw that this probability of the union of the a sub t's must be less than 1. So let's try to see what does that mean for the probability of the union of the a sub t's to be less than 1. Well, we can say then that with non-zero probability, the union of the a sub t's is false. In other words, none of the events a sub t occurs. And in other words, our red-blue coloring that we did in our experiment has no copy of k sub s that has all edges the same color. So that happens with non-zero probability. That means that it's possible for us to run the experiment and find a red-blue coloring of k sub n that has no copy of k sub s with all edges the same color. And by definition, that implies that the Ramsey number of s comma s must be greater than n. So here is a problem for you to think about. And what we just proved might be useful for this. So see if you can prove that the Ramsey number of s comma s, the diagonal Ramsey numbers that we've been looking at, 
must be greater than the floor function of two to the S over two. And note that if we look at the, the S, one over S root of this, so R of S comma S to the one over S, this is going to be greater than square root of two. And why is that? Well, R of S comma S down here, we know that that's greater than the floor function of two to the S over two. And that implies since the floor function of two to the S over two is an integer and R of S comma S is an integer, that implies that R of S comma S is greater than or equal to the floor function of two to the S over two plus one. And this is greater than two to the S over two. So that's why we can conclude that the Ramsey number of S comma S raised to the one over S power is greater than square root of two, which is two to the one half. So we found some bounds on the S root of the diagonal Ramsey numbers, R of S comma S. And I will clear that for our next slide. So let's look at a few open problems related to limits of the S root, one over S power, in other words, of these Ramsey numbers. So one open problem is to determine whether or not the limit as S goes to infinity of R of S comma S to the one over S exists. And if that limit does exist, another open problem is to determine what is that limit equal to? And it's known, as I mentioned before, that the S root of the Ramsey number R of S comma S is in this interval with lower bound square root of two and upper bound four. Here's another open problem. So the lower bound proof that we just did using probabilistic methods, using the union bound, we didn't construct a coloring of k sub n that had no copy of k sub s with all edges of the same color. Um, we just proved that such a coloring exists. So we didn't construct the coloring, we just proved that there must exist a coloring like that. And it's an open problem to find, instead of a probabilistic proof, a, constru a constructive proof. So to actually construct the coloring that shows that r of s comma s is greater than one plus k to the s for some constant k greater than zero. So even a constant like k equals 0 0.001, it's an open problem to prove this, that r of s comma s is greater than one plus k to the s constructively. So the open part is the constructive part. And here's another category of open problem. So a lot of people study small values of Ramsey numbers and try to improve the current bounds on the small values or to try to find exact values. So for example, it's known that the Ramsey number of three comma three is equal to six. It's also known that the Ramsey number of four comma four is equal to 18. But once you get to five, even that is an open problem to find R of five comma five. There's only bounds that are known for that. And here's, here's a really interesting quote from Erdős, who's one of the most famous mathematicians that studied Ramsey problems and graph theory. And he said, suppose that aliens invade the earth and threaten to obliterate it in a year's time, unless human beings can find the Ramsey number for red five and blue five. We could marshal the world's best minds and fastest computers. And within a year, we could probably calculate the value if the aliens demanded the Ramsey number for red six and blue six, however, we would have no choice but to launch a preemptive attack. So that tells you how hard Erdős thought it was 
to calculate r of six comma six. But r of five comma five might be doable if aliens were threatening us. Here's a more general Ramsey problem. And this is actually closer to the original problem that Ramsey was looking at. Suppose instead of only using two colors, we color the edges of k sub n with c colors for some c that's greater than or equal to two. We generalize the Ramsey number r of s comma t by defining r of s1, s2, s3, all the way up to s sub c as the minimum n such that for any c coloring of the edges of k sub n, a c coloring being a coloring that uses c colors, which we can call 1, 2, up to c. So for any c coloring of the edges of k sub n, there must exist some color in 1, 2, up to c. We'll call that color j, such that there is a copy of k of s sub j. So k sub s sub j, and this is s sub j somewhere in this list, s1, s2, up to s sub c. s sub j will be one of those elements. And this copy of k sub s sub j and k sub n must have all edges having the color j. So that's how we generalize the definition of Ramsey numbers to c colors instead of just two colors. And here's a problem for you. And I claim this problem, it's possible to prove it pretty similarly to how we did with two colors. But you're welcome to prove it any way that works for you. So prove that that number that I defined in the second bullet, r of s1, s2 up to s sub c, prove that it actually has a finite value. So like we did with two colors, prove that this is actually defined to have a finite value and, and see what bound you can get on it. It doesn't have to be a good bound. It can be a very rough bound. Now, the fact that R of S1, S2 up to S sub C is finite, this is known as Ramsey's theorem. And what's interesting is that Ramsey proved this to prove a result in logic. So this theorem was just a lemma that Ramsey used to prove a result um, about the solvability of a certain class of sentences in first order logic. And this word here, solvability, I'll just mention what it means is decidability for satisfiability. Now that might seem even more confusing than the word solvability. So let's talk about that for a second. So if you have some sentence of first order logic. To say it's satisfiable just means that there exists some structure that makes it true. And if it's not satisfiable, it means that there's no structure that makes it true. So for a class of first order logic sentences to be decidable for satisfiability, it just means that we need a procedure, specifically a decision procedure for the sentences in that class. So we just need to find an algorithm that given any sentence in that class tells us whether or not that sentence is satisfiable by some structure. And our algorithm, the only requirement on the algorithm is that it has to be recursive. So that's the kind of problem that Ramsey was looking at when he proved this theorem that's, that's now known as Ramsey's theorem. And this is back in 1928. And much later, decades later, uh, Ramsey theory started getting popular. So studying these kind of problems for graphs in general uh, became a really popular research area. And we'll learn more about it in some future videos. So before we finish this video, let's look at an interesting application 
of Ramsey's theorem. And this is known as Schur's theorem. And I called it an application of Ramsey's theorem, but it's not really fair to say that because Schur's theorem was proved before Ramsey's theorem. So the original proof clearly did not use Ramsey's theorem, but the proof using Ramsey's theorem is very short. So we'll look at that proof on this slide. Schur's theorem says for all integers k greater than or equal to two, that there exists some integer n greater than three, such that for any coloring x of one, two, up to n by k colors, there must exist three distinct integers, a, b, c, of the same color in this coloring x, such that a plus b equals c. So like I said, this was proved before Ramsey's theorem. It was proved in 1916. And we're gonna use Ramsey's theorem to prove it here, just to see how it's a nice corollary of Ramsey's theorem. So we'll define n to be the minimum possible integer, such that any coloring of the edges of k sub n by k colors must contain a triangle with all edges of the same color. And by what we said on the previous slide, this n has to be finite. Now, we look at Schur's theorem. Schur's theorem is talking about a particular coloring x. So for any given coloring x, the claim is that there exists three distinct integers, a, b, c, of the same color in x. So given this coloring x, it's a coloring of one, two, up to n, and it's the coloring, same one in the statement of Schur's theorem, we're gonna use that coloring of these integers one, two, up to n to define an edge coloring of k sub n. And we're gonna use that edge coloring of k sub n to apply Ramsey's theorem to be able to say something about this coloring x. So we're gonna convert x from a coloring of these integers one up to n to a coloring of the graph k sub n and then use Ramsey's theorem on that graph k sub n and the coloring we make from x to conclude something about x. So we'll let the vertices of this graph k sub n be one, two, up to n. And here's how we'll color it. Given an edge, x comma y, we will color x comma y using the color that we use for x minus y absolute value in, so looks like a typo there, that should be in x. So not in c, but in x right there. So we will color this edge, x comma y, using the color of the absolute value of x minus y in the coloring x up here. So this coloring x is of the integers one, two up to n. We know that x and y right here, these two are distinct. Since there's an edge x comma y, none of our edges are self loops. So x is not equal to y. And that tells us that the absolute value of x minus y is going to be in the set one, two, up to, and we can see it's gonna be up to only n minus one. Since, since they're distinct and since the integers we're looking at are between one and n, so we can conclude that. So each of these edges, x comma y, we will color it just using the color that we use on the integer that is the absolute value of x minus y. And we're gonna use the coloring from x. So we were given this coloring x in the statement of Schur's theorem, and we're just using that coloring to color each of the edges of our graph, k sub n. And by definition of n, so we can look back up at the definition of n up here. So n was the minimum such that any coloring of k sub n by k colors must contain a triangle where all the edges are the same color. And we see here that we just did a coloring of k sub n by k colors uh, when we defined this coloring that was based on x. And this is again an x right here. So by definition of this n, any coloring of the edges of k sub n by k colors 
must contain a triangle where all of the edges of that triangle have the same color. And that's what we're claiming this last bullet. So that's just from the definition of N. And we'll take that triangle. We'll assume that triangle is on the vertices X, Y, Z. Now, without loss of generality, we can assume that X is less than Y is less than Z. We'll just let X be the smallest one, Z be the largest one. And they're all distinct. Then, since X is less than Y, then we know Y minus X is positive. And since Y is less than Z, Z minus Y is positive. And clearly Z minus X is positive. So we can define A equal to Y minus X, B equal to Z minus Y, and C equal to Z minus X. And we can note that all three of these, A, B, and C, are elements of one, two, up to n. Actually, we can even say they're only elements up to n minus one. So can't equal n. And what does that give us? Well, by definition, all three of these integers, a, b, and c, they must have the same color in x. And, and why, why is that? So let's look at the details of that for a second. So we had a triangle on the vertices x, y, z, where all the edges had the same color. So the edge x, y, the edge x, z, and the edge y, z. These are all same color in case of n, the coloring that we made from x. That tells us since their coloring is just the color of the integers, absolute value of x minus y, absolute value of x minus z, absolute value of y minus z. That tells us, so this right here gives us that the absolute value of x minus y must have the same color as the absolute value of x minus z and the same color as the absolute value of y minus z. So all three of these must have the same color as each other. And that's just by definition of the coloring we made in this bullet. And the absolute values, each of these absolute values, by how we chose our x, y, and z, absolute value of x minus y is y minus x, absolute value of x minus z is z minus x, and absolute value of y minus z is z minus y. And we're saying that y minus x, z minus x, and z minus y all of the same color. And then A is equal to Y minus X, B is equal to Z minus Y, and the C right here, that's Z minus X. So those three. And so substitution tells us A, B, and C all have the same color. And again, this is the same color in the coloring X now, because we're talking about integers here. So we converted from the coloring of the complete graph of order N here, and now this is the same color in X, for the integers here. So A, B, and C have the same color in X. And moreover, we can see that A plus B equals C. So A is Y minus X, Y minus X plus Z minus Y. We can see that that equals Z minus X because those Y's cancel. And so that gives us Schur's theorem. And That's everything. So thanks for watching.